Hi, Marian. Let's get started. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you. Welcome to Art Speak Collective, where art has a voice. Good afternoon. A group of my friends who talk regularly invited me to join in the conversation. Sometimes we meet in person, and of course lately we've been meeting here in the virtual video world. Recently, we all came to the same conclusion, that sharing our dialogue with others could be, would be inspiring or even useful, just as it was for us. So we created Art Speak Collective, and with that, we say welcome to the first of many online conversations where artists' collective voice can be heard. We hope you join the conversation with us every month. We find it'll be an intimate way to hear artists' personal stories, their process, their inspirations, subject matter, challenges, and techniques. We'll touch on how they've honed their craft, their evolution. We'll delve into what spurs their amazing creativity. Our goal is that these conversations give you, our audience, a more in-depth experience than you might get in a gallery setting. To be clear, we are not trying to cobble together a temporary solution just because galleries recently closed. Instead, we are creating an additional layer of the conversation, articulating our belief that artists' voices can't be silenced. And here's the best part. We found a way for our art to help others, something we've all felt driven to do over the past few months. You see, the team at Art Speak Collective is committed to giving back. That's why any art shown in the series is available for purchase with the following caveat. 30% of the proceeds will be given to Catalyst Kitchens, the national initiative of Fair Start. Let's for a quick second talk about who they are and what they do and why we chose them as our first recipient. Fair Start supports more than 80 nonprofits that are providing real solutions to poverty, homelessness, and hunger in North America. They help people overcome barriers by teaching them work-life skills through their restaurants, cafes, catering, and programs. In addition to training, they also provide meals and social services, shelters to schools through one of their programs called the Catalyst Kitchens. Since 2011, Fair Start and the Catalyst Kitchens Network have provided over 72 million meals and placed over 14,000 individuals who'd been experiencing barriers to employment and jobs into jobs. And we've even found a group that will match dollar for dollar any donations that we facilitate, even online at theartspeakcollective.com. In fact, we're finalizing a few donation partnerships in the next few weeks with well-vetted causes in our hope to protect and ensure justice and fairness. This is yet another way that artists' voice can be heard. So, Let's get started. Today's episode, we're featuring some of ArtSpeak Collective's founding members, Denise Adler, Barbara Shelley, Laurie lamont Lurie, and myself, Marion Roger. Our first guest is Barbara Shelley, a native Philadelphian. Barbara's been a student and teacher of the arts both there and in New York for decades. She's a self-taught mixed media artist known for literally and figuratively tearing through print media, layering it into textured collages using sketches, newspaper ink, and paint. Her creative instincts place the images, covering some for texture and highlighting others. The intentional and unintentional relationships to the subjects emerge in her finished works and leave room for the, room for the viewer to interpret just what she's saying. Her love of the performing arts is part of her DNA. Happily, her art finds its way to her subjects. Some of those who have even purchased her pieces include Spike Lee and Stella Abrera from the American Ballet Theater. She's been in both solo and group shows in Philadelphia and New York areas. And in March of this year, she curated an 18 woman show for Women's History Art Month at the Goddard Riverside Community Center. What a pleasure it is for me to welcome you, Barbara. Help me do an even better job. Um, can I bring you into the spotlight with you giving us some of your own words? Sure, thanks, Marion. My paintings combine all my passions, like dance and fashion into another form of artistic expression. And paint allows me to capture color and design and movement. And I love making the paint dance on the canvas. The people I paint are in the news with stories I feel 
are very worth telling. I love what you just said about making paint dance on canvas. Ever the ballerina and choreographer. Next, we have Denise Adler with us today. Denise is New York City based and studied with artist Juanita McNeely in the 1970s. She's influenced by feminist art and expressionism. Attended Buffalo State University for two years where she studied printmaking and then graduated from Hofstra University with a degree in the fine arts. She sets out to create portraits and dreamscapes. They express both the mythic and the legendary. Her pieces, both personal and archetypical, memorialize a moment in time. Her mixed media work often takes the form of drawings, painting, and collage. Magazines, photographs, and found materials all factor in and become the story within a story. Her solo show in Quintessence, which by the way literally means the fifth or purest essence of a thing, examined the con in contemporary culture the multifaceted connections between the internal, the external, and the virtual, and illustrated a deeper sense of reality. So welcome, Denise. I know I didn't do you justice. Help me out here. Give me some of your own words. Thank you, Marion. That, that was pretty complete. Um, I'll just add that um, basically my work is, um, like Barbara, a reaction to the news around me and the, um, the world I live in. And um, I use current events and, and news to inspire my work. Um, when, I, when I look back, I can usually pinpoint uh, what I was feeling at the time when I created the work. Um, it might be empathy, happiness, disbelief, horror, um, and it's all in there. Um, I'm using media, basically, in paint to tell a story. Thank you. You know, when you say you want to tell a story, I can't wait to hear some of your stories today when we look at your pieces. And spoiler alert to our audience, it's legendary and a fantastic conversation ahead. Joining us next from her studio near Philadelphia is Lori Murray. Lori's from Seattle, lived in Southern California for several years before she moved east. Her architectural and interior design background seems almost built into her paintings and her metal sculptures. So adding 3D to her toolbox became almost inevitable. On canvas, she stretches beyond the limits of the painted surface. Whether we're working with steel or canvas, she's immersed in a conversation between shapes and colors, layers and lines. There's always a geometric element and quite a strong sense of design. This is my favorite part when I talk about Lori. She's often found in junkyards, scrambling up mountains of metal scrap to find some treasure for a repurposed steel sculpture. She confessed to me that she's actually happiest covered with paint and metal dust. Lori is actually known as an abstract artist, but her love of drawing and taking on new challenges sometimes leads her into the realm of abstracted realism. She's won numerous awards and juried shows throughout the greater Philadelphia area, and her work is included in several private corporations and collections, including the Raymond James Wealth Management in Philadelphia and the PNC Corporate Headquarters in Pittsburgh. Her studio in Westchester, Pennsylvania is an annual host for the Chester County Studio Tour and is open by appointment. So Lori, a very warm welcome. There are so many dimensions to who you are. Could you give some color to your multifaceted portrait? Wow, well, thank you so much, Marion. I guess I could just say that as an artist, I'm trying for a cohesive narrative with a balance between the extremes, the darks and the lights and the brights and the thicks and the thins. There's some areas that are static in my work and others are dynamic. I want my art to be explored and enjoyed from the viewers on perspective. So when someone responds to a piece I've made and shares a story about how it connects with them, that's when I feel that I might have succeeded. For me, the process of making art is incredibly freeing and completely absorbing. It's um, a very pure form of happiness. Thank you. So, hey, Marion, let's talk about you. Let's put you in the spotlight. I have learned that Marion is a self-taught artist um, with a passion for both painting and photography. You can see that she's drawn to textures and patterns, 
And you can really feel the interplay of color and light and form in her work. If you ask her, she'll tell you that these elements speak to her, that there's a voice that she can't silence. She says she's mesmerized by reflections with their fleeting patchwork of light and of form. And glass and floral macro photography fascinate her. From there, her work seems to evolve into a more and more abstract product. After years and years of photographing her life from every angle, Marion has discovered that her photographs have become painting themselves. I'm gonna let her explain that one. Did I even get close? You did, and thank you, Lori. That was actually really great. Um, it says better than I could. I, the, my desire is to capture that magical instant where I see something beautiful yet fleeting. Um, it could be something so simplistic as pickled beet juice splotches on my paper plate at a picnic. Uh, but even better, it's when I see a brush stroke or the pigmentation in a flower petal. I guess I'm always in conversation with my environment. I'm trying to capture that fleeting but stunning image that can only be seen when you look beyond the surface of what everybody else is walking right past. Uh, and doing that is a way for me to journey into myself. And so that's really where it's all for me. You know, thinking about creativity and, and my journey and the source of my voice, I've been listening to you guys in the last few minutes talk about you. And it, it takes me back to high school when one of our English teachers pushed us to really listen and tune into what other people said by listening to the words that they used. I'm noticing a lot of adjectives. Uh, they're shouting at me, and I'm sure the audience hears them as well. And I'm not talking schmaltzy, art speak words that are pretentious. I'm talking about raw, honest vocalization of what we see as our work. So how about a real quick go round where we all answer this question. If someone met you for the first time and had never seen your work before, could you describe your style using three unique adjectives or concepts? I just want three quick words to show who you really are and what your art's about. For example, me, my three words would be fleeting, soft, and painterly. I capture things that only exist for a second, uh, soft and painterly because I love how the shapes and colors can merge and fuse into a blurry, gorgeous palette, and painterly because photography is my way of painting. So, Lori, why don't you give it a shot and give me three words. Okay, um, I guess most of all my work is dynamic. There's a lot of energy in what I do, and there's change. Right now on one easel in my studio, there's an abstract, and on another, there's a work supporting Black Lives Matter, and a bunch of sketches all over the floor and stuff. I guess committed or vocal could be another word, because I, yeah. I think that art can help bring about change. I guess I've never really wanted to paint pretty little pictures. Oddly enough, I could make tranquil my third word because I've always been influenced by nature, particularly the timelessness and power of ocean waves. Yeah, dynamic versus tranquil to me are so diametrically opposed. What do you mean? Like, how can you have two adjectives that kind of to me meant opposite things? Can you explain that? Well, not everything I do can be described with the same three adjectives. Some of my work is energetic and other pieces are tranquil. And I'm not always trying to help bring about change. But since you ask, ocean waves can be very forceful and yet soothing in their repetition, you think? True. Yeah. So how about Barbara? What are your three words? I think my three words would be emotion, penetrating, and story. Um, I always have a strong emotional reaction to people's expressions and their eyes and their poses and photographs. Um, and then I read their story and I want to tell their story. So. Oh my God, when you said the eyes, I realized when we look at your work later, you'll really notice the eyes pop. That's so true. How about you, Denise? What are your four, three words? Um, I guess um, I would start with fantastic because I use dreams and ideas to fuel my subject matter. Um, the next one would be poetic um, because um, 
I think of my pictures as being kind of rhythmic compositions that try to channel an idea and a thought and beauty and symbolic because I use um, a language of uh, I use the language of, of images to, to communicate certain ideas. True. I get, I get what you're saying there. And those are, those are all good words, really. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm even listening deeper and it just, it's a question that's burning. How far back does all of this go for us? And I'm, I'm recalling a very simple question that was once asked of Joan Mitchell, the mid century abstract artist in an interview. And they asked, when did you first think of art? Who'd like to give that one a shot? I will. Um, I guess I, I have to give my mom some credit. Um, she had an artistic sensibility and, and she loved the Impressionists. She, she was always cutting pictures from art books and magazines and, and putting them in these elaborate frames she'd pick up at um, garage sales. Um, and they were all over in little groupings all over our house. Um, she loved, um, she had a good sense of color and, and, and style and she, um, she decorated the apartment, you know, with different um, paint colors and different fabrics on the curtains and the um, upholstery and she would change it up every few years um, as much as she could. Um, so I think that enriched my childhood and gave me a sensibility about um, about art and style and, and color. Um, and also, um, I, I, you know, art classes in, in Catholic school were pretty basic. Uh, they didn't um, have much going on, you know, soap sculptures with ivory soap and doing little pietas and, um, but uh, then I, we moved and I, I was introduced to a full on art studio classroom and it was wonderful. We, we, um, the first project we had was to redesign uh, the Sergeant Pepper's um, uh, album for, for that was our first project. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. So I, I could credit my mother as well. Um, she brought all forms of art into our house. And um, opera, she knew every word to every opera, classical music and dance. But it wasn't really until I got to high school that um, I met my friend who was an artist. And everything she did was an art. And that was my aha moment. This, this is what art is. You know, Barbara, you, you just mentioned your mother as, as all of us did, but your mom was somebody unusual. You told me once about how strong and politically active she was, and also your grandmother. I think that that's a dimension that probably helped you realize art as well. And I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what do you have to say about them in terms of who they were and how they helped you see art? Yeah, they were both powerful women. My grandmother was in the Red Army in Russia. <sighs> And every time I see Fiddler on the Roof, it was my grandmother who was the daughter that went off with the activist. Okay. And it was her story and the babushka and everything. Um, she fled to the U.S. and was a suffragette in Philadelphia. And my mother kind of... Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, and she was a Democratic committee woman in a Republican neighborhood that and had many, many doors slammed in her face. And I think my paintings reflect that history because um, I'm drawn to activists. And actually until we started answering some of these questions, I haven't put that all together. So it all, was all pretty obvious, but it's really interesting to me just to go back and think about it. You know, actually, um I think we had so much fun putting this together, sort of thinking we, we talked about for hours so many different things, but I think we, we kind of had in common how a parent helped us see art. I mean, my mom impacted me in ways I'm only realizing a century later, or half a century later, I should say. Uh, that is when I first thought of art, I was maybe three or four years old at the most, because um, 
my mother would take and save empty glass bottles of all sizes and shapes and fill them with water and give me food coloring and let me drop and she would drop a color into the bottle of water and we would watch the colors mix together and float around and then she'd put them up on the shelves in the kitchen window where the sun would come streaming through and the magic of the colors and the lights and the reflections I think it totally just imprinted me as a beautiful thing that I was I just wanted to keep doing and seeing you know and of course then there was Santa Claus who brought me a kaleidoscope every year for Christmas and my birthday. I mean, I think I had like eight or nine by the time I was seven years old. I was, I'm actually still hypnotized when I look through a kaleidoscope and, and even just my lens of my camera is a kaleidoscope because there's changing patterns and colors, lights coming through water, glass. That's really where it's at. Oh, wow. That sounds like a beautiful thing to experience. I have to tell you, my childhood was art central. My dad was an architect and an amazing artist. My mom drew really well, but she had lost confidence when a college professor told her she'd never be any good. Oh. Um, she encouraged us, uh, all three kids, um, with all kinds of projects and saved everything we ever drew. Um, I think my first art project that anyone recognized was at age two. Um, it's in a box somewhere still. <laughs> um, we were always making art and everyone had a corner of the basement for our own little art tables. And then in first grade, my art teacher handed out some fat crayons and I complained that they were too big to draw with. And she looked at me and she said, if I was half as good as my sister, I could draw with anything. So I guess I accepted the challenge. Wow. <laughs> Lori, you said your mom was, was discouraged by her teacher to, to, to go into the art field. Um, it's so sad. I feel, I feel terrible for her. Um, it's, it's like such a repetition of like everything in that, that century. Like women, I guess, in you know, history or art, women were always discouraged from going into it. You know, it's with few exceptions, they weren't, they were ignored, you know. Um, there's a uh, quote that I read in my research on this about um, uh, Lee Krasner's um, instructor at the time was Hans Hoffman and he, um, he complimented her by saying, this is so good, you wouldn't know it was done by a woman. Um, and it Ugh. stuck with me that, you know, like, <laughs> um, did your mom ever uh, start drawing again or do anything in the artistic field? Um, not um, seriously, but she would quietly produce a drawing now and then. And she did collect art and really did her homework, uh, learning about her purchases. Um, boy, I tell you, I'm, I'm heartbroken to hear about Hans Hoffman. He was one of my heroes. I think he's just gotten demoted. <laughs> and it sucks. <laughs> you know, Denise, you were telling us a legend about a cave woman and the first piece of art. Oh yeah, no, um, I was, re again, in my research, I'm, I'm all into um, myths and legends. And um, evidently there was a, um, the, the, the legend of the first actual drawing um, on a cave wall um, was uh, this, by a woman, the first drawing was a picture of her lover um, on the cave wall. So that is, written somewhere in some legend. I can't remember exactly who wrote it down, but um, so there you have it. I love it. it. I love that you did <laughs> so, some research on that because it's, it's a fascinating topic. Um, I, I want to come back to Lori for a moment. You know, you were, you, you sort of knew it from day one. It was like art was just something there that was part of you. And it reminds me of that old saying, uh, try to explain water to a fish. And I'm, I'm just curious, compared to us, like how did it feel to you being born into it? Just there, it was, you didn't know anything but it. Did you actually ever run away from it or rebel or reject it? I guess um, this conversation makes me feel that I really was very lucky. Um, <laughs> expectations were definitely high at my house and there was always some competition with my siblings. It was my brother who was expected to become the architect because he was a boy. Hmm. Uh, so for a while I wanted to stake a new claim and, and I majored in psychology when I got to college. But um, I think that art chooses us rather than the other way around. And really since then everything I've done 
in their careers and, and on the side, advertising and interior design and, and painting classes and, and fine art has been steeped in art, so. Thanks. You know, I, I could, as you by now know, go down the rabbit hole and go completely off track of the schedule, but I won't. But I can tell you, this is like a great nugget of conversation because I'm, this is something we could maybe do a theme on with, with some other artists or whatever. But, you know, the, the reason I'm saying it is because I just learned that work by women artists makes up only three to five percent of major permanent collections in the United States and Europe. Did you guys know that? Yeah, yeah that's why I like the book. Uh, Ninth Street Women's <laughs> Sorry. Um, they didn't get the credit for the abstract expressionist movement that happened mid century. Men did. I just ordered that book. Thank you for the heads up, Barbara. I, and when we get off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check it out. Um, I have to confess, I was one of those young ladies who was scared off by, our, by my dad. Um, he dropped the phrase a starving artist and choosing to make. Uh, choosing art to be my way of making a living at 18 or 19 was just so intimidating. I could think of nothing worse than being a starving artist. And what if nobody bought my art? And um, let me tell you, anybody who knows me knows I like good food. So, you know, that was like a no brainer. I just couldn't imagine it. And gosh, high school, I just wish I could go back to art class and be with Lisa Farrell. She's quite an accomplished artist today. She knew her soul was a true artist. Our high school friends really impacted us. Right, Barbara? You were talking about one from your school? Absolutely. Just, just like my high school friend um, inspired me, um, everything I did was art, um, whether it was dance or fashion. And then five years ago, there was a void in my life, and a friend suggested I take an art class. And I got very lucky. I found a teacher, Kasim Amude, who saw the artist in me. Um, just like when I was in my 20s, I found a ballet teacher who saw the dancer in me. But I think art really changed me. Um, I was no longer um, a, a mother or a grandmother or a wife. I had become something different. I became an artist. You know, your voice was waiting to be heard and you found the right stage. I mean, it, you're an artist, whether it was on stage as a ballerina or painting, but it's, it's just an, a new way. Um, and I'm thinking about, I like, keep hearing voices and the voices that are hoping to be heard. We're living in a world right now. I mean, it's truly, it goes without saying, a moment in history. I mean, life as we know it is probably a thing of the past. And that might be a good thing and it might not be a good thing. But what comes next is just so unpredictable, to say the least. There are just so many vital topics and issues bubbling to the surface. Everyone listening in today right now um, probably has felt a tectonic change in their own life in some way, shape, or form. And in fact, uh, in preparation for this event, we started receiving emails from some of the people that were planning to attend. And one of them threw a question at us and said, please make sure you talk about how you guys are reacting, feeling, coping, and creating during this current epic time. So I'd like to know how it's impacted your creativity, your productivity, your emotions. I thought it was a great catalyst to start off the Q&A section. Let me turn it over to you guys. Barbara, since you were just speaking, why don't you tell us first? Okay, so um, I was painting in two arts studios, two art centers with so many different artists. And we would always share ideas and comment on each other's work. And that ended just abruptly. And for two months, I couldn't pick up the paintbrush. It just felt really heavy. Um, but then something happened in May and all of a sudden the inspiration came back and I almost thought I was finished painting. You know, I painted for five years and maybe that was gonna be it, but I'm back. You should, uh, never, you should never stop painting, Barbara. Yeah. I think that the coronavirus just knocked everyone to their knees. It was so overwhelming. Everything we did and do was closed or on hold. And um, while we were trying to figure out where to get toilet paper, Brielle <laughs> was murdered. Omad was jogging and he was murdered. And America just shook its head, couldn't process. I was working on a portrait for Soul Shot, which is a traveling exhibit about gun violence. And I started to wonder, really wonder if the people who need to see shows like that ever do. 
Mm. Artists, are we just talking to ourselves? Mm. Riona was an EMT for God's sake, but it took a video. We had to see, literally see George Floyd dying to really figure it out. It got our attention. And at that point I, I felt paralyzed. Um, and it has taken a while to regain my voice and to respond to so much crisis. But art does have the ability and maybe the responsibility to call attention to what's so very wrong in our country. So I paint. Great response. Uh, for me, COVID-19 drove home the, the frailty and fragility of, um, of life and, and how um, susceptible we are. And um, it's, it made me feel stuck and vulnerable and um, like I couldn't paint um, at first. And I was trying to um, go look into history because that's what I do and, and looking at older paintings and, 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 and other plagues um, that we, that have the world's experience. So I, I, I looked at the artist, um, uh, an Italian artist who did portraiture, um, Giuseppe uh, Archimboldo. I have to write down the name because it's not, it doesn't flow off my tongue. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and he, he's the one who did those um, vegetable um, yeah. fruit uh, paintings that, um, portraits that um, they usually uh, were sort of, they could be very grotesque and they could be very beautiful. Um, but I was really taken with this one that was titled uh, Sense of Smell. So I did my own version of it in collage. Um, and, and that piece uh, was, um, I, I named it Sense of Smell. I, I thought ironic because one of the symptoms of COVID is that um, we could lose our sense of smell. So I thought that was fun. So that seemed to get me out of a little bit of my funk. And then the powers that be and brought us the, the, the death of George Floyd and Brianna and all, all of the others and the, you know, the list goes on just this year. Um, and I, um, I just, I, I, it to was a total shift for me. I said, I read somewhere many years ago that there was already too many paintings of white people. And, um, and that, that resonated a lot for me. Um, and, and I, I realized, you know, like, it's like how one of the ways we control uh, white privilege is one of the ways we control the narrative. Um, just like there's the woman who created, who for, did the first drawing was never noticed until, you know, we go down in deep, just darkest tunnels of Google to find it. Um, <laughs> the white, white men have controlled the narrative for so many years. So um, it's up to us to sort of, as artists, to, to use that as inspiration and, and make change, you know, when we can, how we can, with our art. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm listening to the three of you and I'm embarrassed a little bit because I'm going to say something so different in a lot of ways. For me, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. I mean, it's a confession, but it's the truth. Um, art was a self-medicating tranquilizer when I was having a difficult, traumatic childhood. And then I walked away from it. So uh, this, the last three months, I, I lost my job. I was in a lockdown. But it was amazing because I knew exactly what I had to do, just go out and get my toolbox, which is my paint, my photography, my sketching. And it was the one thing that I... I, I realize it gives me pleasure and gives me hope. Don't get me wrong. It also made me face my mortality. I mean, I've had friends die in car accidents and cancer in a couple of weeks or months. It's not like I didn't know that, you know, I could be gone tomorrow, but it just really drove home for me how quickly my own life could change. And um, my embracing this voice that I've had trying to get out for 50 years, practically, um, is I realize it's the one thing about, 
life that I can control right now. I don't know how much other things I can really control, but I can control my creativity, my motivation, my colors. It, it just gives me pleasure. Um, I don't want to waste another minute and I'm just grateful to COVID and, and everything else that's going on in our world that, you know, it's, it's cracked the shell so that I can come out and do what I like to do. Um, and, and that voice was crying to be heard. Um, and, and I'm grateful. So that's how it's been for me. Uh, but I think what, what's really driving right now is that we want to talk to you about our individual pieces and show them to you one-on-one. -on -one. We had so much fun picking which art. We, were, we could only do four pieces each. And so before going live this afternoon, um, we spent a little time figuring out why we picked each one. And we're just so glad to be talking about how it's impacted our creativity. But what was crazy was some of the pieces that were picked for today's exhibition are very recent pieces, while some others are older, but resonated now. So, um, you know, let's, let's kind of look at each one of our guests' art right now, one-on-one, -on -one, and we're gonna have a little one-on-one -on -one time with them and their art. Barbara, take over. Mm -hmm. So my first piece is Thank You for Loving Me. And her name is Stella Nyanzi. She was released from prison uh, on an 18 month prison sentence for insulting the longtime president in Uganda. He, she insulted the president and his wife. Uh, he's been in power for 34 years. She was a teacher at the country's largest and most prestigious university. Um, she stripped naked and chained herself to a fence in protest. So I saw the passion in that photo and people came from long distances to celebrate her freedom. Um, and she says, thank you for loving me. She said, to love me is to invite hate. And some of us have been hated so much that we don't know how to do love. Hmm. She also said, be bad for the sake of the cause and don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. My next piece is Friends. And this was from a fashion ad. So these two women have these penetrating eyes and expression and pose. And I think they exude confidence and power. And I think if I were to guess what they were saying, it would be, don't mess with me and I've got your number. <laughs> the third piece is Big Fridia. This is Freddie Ross, who is Big Fridia and has two distinct identities. She is the queen of New Orleans bounce music. And the photo was from a concert in Brooklyn in 2018. I loved the movement in her hair. And I was so happy, happy to be able to capture that movement in the painting. And the final piece is cop or COVID. It was a photo in the New York Times of Mike Griffin, a community organizer in Minneapolis. His godfather died of COVID. His quote was, I'm as likely to die by cop as COVID. He also said, while well, everyone is facing the battle against the coronavirus, black people in America are still facing the battle against racism and coronavirus. And the virus exposed all of it. Barbara, I really love that piece. It's really beautiful. Um, you intentionally use words as part of your palette. Um, and I see some messages in there and I, I see some words that are separate. Is there anything else you'd like to um, expand on there? Is in there any message? <laughs> sure. um, in his hair, it says there is never and down his shirt is a bad time for change. They're also in very small letters that they are going to kill me. And there are a couple of Joy, George Floyd um, street art photos in there too. And so I had the red and white stripes and some stars that could represent the flag or could represent bars. It's to the uh, viewer's interpretation. Wow. Why did you select these four pieces out of all of your collection? Um, they moved me and their stories are relevant and I paint what I love and what's happening now. 
and I have a, an emotional attachment to all of my paintings. <laughs> I can relate. You know, when I'm looking at your art and everybody's, I notice we're making statements of some sort. Uh, in fact, Lori, your work actually is really speaking to some important themes. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about them and how you came to choose them for today. It was really hard to decide. I ended up choosing four pieces which hopefully reflect the range of my work. I do a lot of different things, so that's how this came about. The first one is called Unless. There are huge waves tearing into a melting glacier while two polar bears are standing there contemplating their options. I borrowed the title from one of my favorite Dr. Seuss books, The Lorax, who said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. <laughs> That's great. Glaciers were already starting to melt when I humored my mother by going with her on a cruise to Alaska years ago. No one realized then how much environmental damage cruise ships do, and I still kind of feel guilty. <laughs> the, the painting is intentionally abstract to take the edge off the tsunami of destruction, but the waves are also a tribute to Hokusai's great wave. You've probably seen it over the years. Uh, there is also some Where's Waldo humor in this painting. The viewer has to find those bears. So the next painting I call Blurring the Lines. And it's my backdrop today, as well as this painting. It's actually a, a big vertical. But uh, on the one hand, it's a purely geometric composition with softened boundaries. But I was also thinking when I softened those boundaries about the fact that we're all flesh and blood and equally deserving of decent housing, education, jobs, and quality health care and most of all, being treated fairly. So the third painting I chose is Surprise Me, which is an example of my purely abstract work. I tend to assign myself new problems to solve. And this one came about as I was wondering about how a painting could feel a little bit like a collage and the title reflects a whole series of surprises that happen along the pathway from concept to completion. I usually paint to music, mostly jazz, and this one was under the influence of Miles Davis. Hmm. My fourth painting is not a painting. <laughs> it's a steel, iron, and wood sculpture called Wondrous Assemblage because it includes some of my favorite pieces that I've collected from dumpster dives and rural antique haunts along the Brandywine Valley. I think it has strength and motion and absolutely no hidden meanings. I created it in a workshop by the amazing sculptor Stan Smokler, who worked with Frank Stella in New York back in the day. I love, I love all your work, but wow, this is spectacular, and it's the one sculpture that we have in our 12 pieces today. Tell me more about why this one is so resonating to me and others. Oh, thank you for that. Um, I like it because it represents motion and progress within the context of history. There is no functional logic to the pieces that I chose in their new lives. They have become design elements now, representing harmonious but distinct shapes and textures. So people often enjoy seeing parts of the whole, but for me, putting them together in one piece is primarily about design and repurposing. Enough okay, about thanks. you, so, Marion. Let's, let's hear a little bit about your work. Uh, and tell us why you chose the four pieces you did and uh, why they're in the exhibition today. Okay, well, thank you. I'm happy to. Uh, my first piece is called Phoenix Firewater. And this was taken out in Phoenix, Arizona um, at dawn. I always have my camera with me and, you know, I'm loving reflections. And I walked by the pool and in the shallow end, it was, it was a bit of a wind and it was making a lot of waves in the shallow end. And, the tiles along the stairway were just being completely distorted and refracted. And 
that was remarkable in and of itself, but it was just sunrise. And this big orange ball was coming up behind me and reflecting on the glass of the hotel room and beaming down onto the water. And I just was like, oh my God, it's like fire on the water. And I just absolutely loved it. And the motion and the, the shapes, there's just something that's natural. It's not touched up. I don't do Photoshop or any of those things. It's just the way it was. And I just, I, I loved its ephemeral momentary the flash of fire on the water. Um, the second piece that I've got for everybody today is called wrought iron. And again, this has not been touched. This is what I saw through the lens of my camera. I was walking in Liberty State Park here in Jersey City, and there's a beautiful water area with in the middle some sort of a little bubbly arrow fountain kind of thing. And along the far side of it is uh, are a lot of reeds and wrought iron. And again, wind and motion in the water was distracting the reflections of what was normally would have been a mirror. And I just had to just grab it. And um, I love how some of it's perfectly clear and some of it's blurry. Um, and that's, that's kind of the complexity that I liked. The third piece is called block art. And this piece is a photo. I was um, on the sidewalk. I don't remember if it was a garage sale or somebody threw them out, but there were, I definitely remember them. Uh, several of those glass blocks that like Art Deco bathrooms used to have in them. They're about this thick and they're square. And it was right on the sidewalk and there were a couple of them. And I had my camera as I always do. And the grass, the lawn, the the sunlight, uh, the sidewalk, whatever it was, just all being through this clear, transparent glass that should not have had all these colors in it. And this is the end result. And I grabbed it and I just loved it. Um, the fourth piece is called, I speak French. I lived in France for 20 years and my husband's a chef. So of course, when I was in India, I saw the beautiful um, Indian saris and the women making these, uh, I think they're called rossi or something. They're like a crepe and they were, flipping them and it was night it was in the market and I wanted to take a picture for my husband but um I took it wrong and the crepes the, the pancakes whatever are not there but when I got back to the hotel room there was something else and this is it Marion I love all your work but but that Thank last you. piece is um really uh the colors and the, and the composition are very um uninhibited and pure um, can you give us a little bit more detail um, why this last piece, um, it, you know, how you go about mining your photographs for other art? Yes. Um, it was actually taken in 2011, but it was seminal for me. And that's why I picked it for today, because it's the moment that I understood that when I took a picture, it was not for me to remember a moment or a place or show somebody else or even to look at later and paint or draw or sketch from it, but rather the painting became a phot photograph. Um, my eyes just went to the part of the image where their saris were poorly focused. The light was just perfect. And there was a painting right there. There were brush strokes, there was composition. I didn't need to do anything. So while you guys are, are, are in so many ways inspired by current events or burning issues or, or, or something, uh, of that nature. What, what I have as inspiration is this huge amount of all my life I've been taking photos um, and I can just go into a picture and see something. And now I go out and take pictures where I don't even have to worry about looking for the picture because I know exactly what I'm taking at the moment is the picture that's going to be this way. And it, it, it's just a kaleidoscope of form, color, texture, and light. And as you've already heard, these are my muse. But this is, this is why this one just was so important for me. And that's my technique. You do digital, right? It's, it's yes. Um, I shoot with a uh, Nikon D seven thousand. I have a telephoto lens, but I also use my Samsung. It's not a plug for either, but the camera on the Samsung is amazing, and uh, I've got some pictures that I've taken with that that just blow me away. And I'm, if I'm out and I don't have my big camera with me, I've got my phone with me. And walking the dog during lockdown, I took some amazing pictures just with my cell phone. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, Marion, I, I see what you mean. You take one photo and there's so many works of art within that one photograph. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we pull out and we see a bigger picture, actually Denise's art kind of speaks to that. Thank you, Barbara. 
Um, I started with um, my first piece. It's called Resilient Goddess. Um, this piece is from 2019. Um, it's a picture of a woman. Um, I am kind of asking a question here is she is she hemmed in surrounded and with, with an unreachable sky above her or is she a goddess larger than life stepping into the this realm um and i think both things are possibilities um and and i want those to be possibilities i want you to see both aspects i think we play different roles in our lives and and we're heroes in some places and we're just worker bees in others. Um, this person is calm and she has a fixed gaze and she's got flowers sprouting from her and around her and she's very strong and beautiful and resolute. And I feel like my work is about feelings and emotions and I put the junk I find in daily life into each of the pieces. And I, it's a pointedly, I do that pointedly to sort of illustrate um, ideas and to trigger reactions. The next piece is called Warrior. And it was done in 2020. And this picture is of a young woman. Her arm is raised in defiance and she has a gaze that's very fierce but questioning. Um, there's a woman's hand, if you look closely on her forehead, um, and that's sort of suggesting um, feminine solidarity. There's a man's hand on her cheek, and that's kind of suggesting patriarchy. Um, and then there's another arm that's sort of extending in her hair and on her side of her face there that's um, got a tattoo on it and, and the tattoo is of a butterfly and there's a star. And, and I think that kind of is trying to suggest freedom and she's a free spirit and, and this is what makes her a warrior. She's... Um, then my third piece is called Party Like It's 2020. And as the title suggests, it was done recently um, after COVID. Um, and it was my response to being quarantined for about three weeks. Um, and it's an homage to Prince's song, Party Like It's 1999, which was done during the trepidation about uh, the new millennium. And this piece is done during the trepidation of a deadly disease that was killing people left and right. But no worries, she's locked in her room She's got her champagne and she's dressed in her Jasper John's workout outfit and she's doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> My last piece is, um, is the oldest piece here and it's called um, Hope is All That Was Left. And it was done in 2017 and um, I included it here because I think the message still resonates, um, even though it was done a couple, a couple of years ago. And in fact, I think even more so. Um, this piece is of a lone woman. She's walking in um, the woods with the moon behind her or above her. Um, she's wearing a long flowing dress um, that's uh, covered in, in stuff and colors and it's quite beautiful. And um, she is um, basically modeled after, um, this, is, this is basically modeled after the story of Pandora. And um, the story of Pandora is that um, this was, she was a goddess who was um, very beautiful and, and wise, and, but she was also very curious. And Zeus gives her this box and tells her not to open it. Um, and basically Zeus was trying to treat, trick her to release all, he tricked her into releasing all the evils into the world. Um, and this was a punishment to mankind um, for stealing fire. Um, so you should read the myth of Pandora. It's, it's really interesting to um, go into it. Um, when she closes the box, 
um, which she does tries to do right away. Um, it's the only thing left inside at this point is hope. And like all creation tales, um, humans could have lived out their uncomplicated lives in unconscious bliss, um, but for their inquisitive nature. Uh, the almost empty box is symbolic of what is best about human con the human condition, I think. Um, it's our ability to grow and change and to, in, in, in our current world, uh, the belief that we can finally learn from our many past mistakes is what inspires me to give and gives me hope. Wow. Well, Denise, I'm going to get inquisitive here. Um, I see, I, I love Zeus and, and Pandora and all of the, the, uh, the stories, um, grew up with them, but I see fairy tale influence here and maybe German expressionism. Am I right? Absolutely. Um, I love German Expressionist movement and um, I, I especially love the work of um, Scheele and Klimt. Um, Otto Dix is a particular favorite. Um, Cola Pinel, who's a, um, a lesser known, but she was a woman that um, there were lots of them in the um, Expressionist movement. Um, and she's another one that we should all be looking up. Um, they were all visual storytellers, these people, and um, they dealt with like world war and life and death and, and, and all kinds of upheavals. And, um, but also Grimm's fairy tales to go back to, um, I guess they're from, yeah, they were German too. Um, the, I grew up with them. That was what my brother would read to me before I would go to sleep at night. Um, and um, I think if anything colors the language that I'm, the, the symbols that I'm using, um, it's certainly uh, the, the Grimm's fairy tales um, and, and um, all of the, uh, those things would, would be in my dreams at night. And um, it was very much a big part of my um, growing up experience and, and very much part of my, what I bring to my art. Oh, you, you can so see it and feel it. You know, we've been talking for about 45 minutes and I know we've only got a certain amount of time, but I do want to, to validate. Um, I referenced my high school teacher earlier uh, and she said, really listen to what people are saying. But I've also been listening from a different perspective. I don't know about anybody else, but it's almost like a ballet or an opera. All these individual pieces are part of a real chorus. Your works are all vocal, full of movement, um, fluidity, dramatic narratives, fantasy, memories, messages, lamentations, emotions. I mean, in fact, excuse my poetic license here, but I feel like we're all souls singing and we've got some incredible stories with beautiful sequences um, whether we're singing or shouting or whispering um, you know we started out with the art speak collective where art has a voice but it's like right now we're actually hearing the song and I'd like to just say to the audience we were so excited to have 45 of you pre-register you're all sitting at front row seats today and I see that a lot of you have questions and we wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to ask um, we have gotten quite a few. I think um, we might be in a position to get some answers. I don't know if Ginger, uh, did you have anything you wanted to share with us from the audience? Well, I, you know, every, uh, the audience, I think, um, really loved all your stories as much as I did. And I, you know, it was wonderful to actually dive deeper into your artwork, which is you rarely get that chance when you go to a gallery and really hear it from the perspective of the artist. And so, you know, thank you so much for sharing um, that perspective, especially in, in, in sharing hope in your art as well. Um, but uh, I think we, we're uh, almost out of time, but we do have a poll that we'd love to get people's feedback on to help us improve the experience for our future Art Speak Collective. Um, so we're going to uh, launch the poll now. Well, Please, be, before yeah. we do, sorry, Ginger. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Um, we, we know it's dinner hour, and I think we even have some people who've logged in from Australia at five in the morning to join. 
So we had, we had four things that we wanted to say in closing. And the first of them was that we're going to have this little quick poll uh, to help us know what we did well and what we can do better next time. And then after the poll, we also wanted to share that uh, the event was recorded and you can watch it again. If you didn't get a chance to stay for the whole thing, you will be able to and you can share it. Um, and thirdly, wanted to mention that 30% of the sale proceeds from any of the 12 pieces will be donated to Catalyst Kitchen and matched by Focus Philanthropy. But if you simply prefer to just donate directly, um, we will provide you with the links on our website and how to do that. And then um, if you have any desire to have an artist friend or yourself featured in one of our sessions, we welcome that and we'll make it easy for you to submit your application or, or referral. Uh, but there's something really important I say before we close to the poll. And that's Denise, Barbara, Lori, and I want to give a standing ovation to the team behind the curtain at Art Speak Collective who expertly choreographed and orchestrated today's online opening. So big shout out to Ashley Hayes, an amazing graphic artist and digital wizard. She not only went solo on building our entire website and getting our tech organized, but she also created our fabulous logo and managed your registrations. So thank you to Ashley Hayes. And a warm and well-deserved round of applause for you, Ginger Dollywall, our friend, our mentor, and a visionary. You see so much in everyone, like the expert maestro. You coach the best version of ourselves to the stage. You're ahead of your time, as well as generous with it. And for that, we thank you. Aw, that's thank so you. sweet. Thank, thank you, guys. You guys. <laughs> thank you. So this poll, explain to everybody how this works. And so on your screen, you're going to see um, a poll that pops up. Just enter your responses, um, pick the selections, they're very easy. Um, and, um, and then when you're done, um, it's going to give us um, a tally of the responses that we can then use to help improve our next session. We're going to make this into a monthly session and we look forward to having you all join us with our next set of amazing artists. Well, in closing, I think we can just say good night and thank you very much and good morning. Have a good day in Australia if you're still online with us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you, artists. Nice conversation.